Yes, uh, thank you, Richard. So um, we are now come to the episode of data visualization with uh, Matplotlib. So we will start off with a few questions, some motivations why a tool like Matplotlib can be useful for post processing and visualization of data. So, what happens if you cannot automatically produce plots? Yeah, that might, for instance, um, slow down your 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 speed of, of processing raw data. Uh, we will also address a little bit when Matplotlib is a good tool and when one perhaps could have a go at using other libraries. So the objective for this lesson is that we will get going with some examples. We will have some type along, and then there will also be exercises where you will do your first Matplotlib uh, visualizations. Okay. So, so, yeah. so. Yeah, so automation is, is in general here something which is very neat if you get to use to, to it. Uh, and one aspect of this is that um, it can be so that if you are writing your scripts to uh, make your plotting, it might take a longer time than, for instance, using a program with a graphical user interface. But often this is when you do the, the, the plotting for the first time. If you need to do a similar type of plotting 10 times over for similar kind of data sets, then you typically have a good speed up when you're doing it in scripting. And moreover, it, it is reproducible in case you, you need to pass it on to a colleague or to like a third person who might then, for reference in the future, would like to reproduce the, the graphs and plots. Yeah. So uh, and this has happened. Yeah, so Richard, uh, yeah, perhaps you could fill in a little bit more with. Yeah. I mean, this has happened to me many times. So I say, okay, so I'm making this paper. I'll make a figure. It takes a little bit of manual work, but then always, my supervisor is coming in and I'm seeing things. Okay, I need to adjust this a little bit. I need to adjust this a little bit. I need to adjust it a little bit. And if it's automatic, that's easy. If it's not, then I end up spending a whole lot of time on it, more than it would have taken to figure out the tools to do it automatically. Um, yeah, and then it gets even worse when the paper comes back and the reviews are there and I've done something automatic and I don't even remember what it is. So yeah, and that's what we're going to see now. Um, yeah. yeah. So another thing is this, that uh, manual post-processing is something that we in general would like to avoid because this, um, is something that can be very time consuming and also not perhaps reproducible. So, so what can manual post-processing be? That can, for instance, be, and this is not here within this particular lesson, but let's say you're plotting three figures that will go um, as panels into one joint figure that might get into a paper, for instance, or you want to have them grouped on a web page. Then even arranging the positions of, of, of these three figures is something that it might be advantageous to do this by scripting. Mm -hmm. uh, that might have to be that you then need to set the coordinates so the, this and that panel be so many points or have these coordinates relative to the others. So that might, might be a little bit of, of a hurdle in the beginning, but when, once you get used to it, it, it allows for rapid workflow. So, um, why are we starting with Matplotlib? So it's perhaps the most standard uh, Python plotting library. The other Python libraries which are built on top of Matplotlib. If you have earlier experience of Matlab, then you will feel familiar with Matplotlib. It is uh, relatively low level. 
in the sense that that you will get handles to the graphical objects and can then manipulate them one by one. So then other Python packages, if you have a little bit more high level, might then give you more in terms of, of fewer lines of code. Yeah. Um, and we, we will come a little bit to this towards the end of the lesson when we will explore one other library. Yeah. OK, so. Yeah, so. getting started with matplotlib. Is it difficult? It's, uh, it's rather straightforward, I would say, because, um, you, I mean, certainly, as always, you need to have the, the, map, the, the libraries available in a Python environment, mm -hmm. and, and that you have by now, because you did this uh, preparation for the, for the course. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll here go directly to one example. So I scroll down here, and these are many lines of code. So it actually doesn't fit completely on my panel here in the web browser. But I, I copy this, okay. and I paste it into a Jupyter Notebook. So that and before first I... line there, um, matplotlib inline. Are you going to talk about that? Um, yeah, it's good you bring it up. So that's a um, command with, with, the, with the percentage sign that uh, makes the Jupyter Notebook to display the rendered graphics within the notebook. OK, so that's like the integration of matplotlib and Jupyter somehow. Yeah. 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 OK. Yeah, so then with this, if we run it, I see it makes some artificial data and it runs some commands to make a figure and axis and runs scatter, which I guess makes a scatter plot. And then it sets some labels. Indeed. So here is the result that we will obtain. So we could just highlight here in the code. So we have the import command, and it's a sim single library. PLT uh, is a common abbreviation as object name for, for the library. You have data here in, in two one-dimensional arrays. Um, these are not NumPy arrays, but, but just Python data here. Mm -hmm. uh, these are completely arbitrary. Um, Okay. We have here a handle to subplot, and, and I think we will talk about that a little bit uh, later after the first exercise. But for now, yeah, just note that we have two handles here, fig and axe. And axe is then for the axis. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we're plotting is the data in the Y array versus the data in the X array. And we specify the color. And this is in hexadecimal notation. So it's R, G, B, red, green, blue, with two letters for each component. So running from A, no, from, from one up until um, F. Yeah. Oh, no, sorry, from, from zero up until F. The A, this set label and set title commands uh, do precisely what they sound like. So I execute. OK. And, and then, see. yeah, we got the result as we have then here on, on, on included on, on the web page. So these lines of code, uh, about 10 of them, produced um, something. Yeah. And it looks pretty reasonable. Not the fanciest thing, but yeah. OK. That's, uh... I, I would say that Matplotlib have uh, reasonable defaults. So um, we, what we have here in, in terms of sizes of, of the markers and uh, sizes of the fonts and ticks are, it's, it's a good starting point, but, but probably not what we would like to have in the end. 
Yes, first here, yes. Uh, one technical remark here. In case we are running on perhaps not your local computer and perhaps not in Jupyter, but you run, let's say, on a server, the login of the supercomputer, say, um, you might need to add this statement here yeah. so that you can render the graphics without render it so that it can be, be um, printed uh, to file, even if you cannot see it. Yeah, this used to be a big thing. Like if you're doing something completely automatic, um, well, when you see the error message, you'll try to remember this and you can search for the right keywords to add in there. But yeah, otherwise it tries to use your display. So, okay. Um, so should we go to the exercise now or look at more first? Well, we could just briefly mention what it is about. But so, it's also time for a break soon. Should we have break and then exercise introduction or exercise introduction and then a long break plus exercise time? Maybe let's talk about the exercise and then we can have a long period. Yes, that, that sounds good. Okay, so this so, exercise. So Richard, can you per perhaps uh, paste the direct link in the HackMD? Oh yes, to the exercise? I'll do that. So um, essentially you're start, you will start out from the code snippet which was above and uh, you're going to um, edit this plot to make it look a little bit more fancy. And also you're going to augment it with data. So uh, yeah, it's, it, it's listed here. So you will add one more data set, data two underscore Y. You will also rescale the data with a factor of two. And you will also try to uh, assign uh, legends to the data so that you can keep them apart. And yeah, one, one comment here. Um, Matplotlib is then fully compatible with Python and libraries such as NumPy. So th this is what allows us to do this uh, very simple uh, manipulation, namely the, the multiplication with a factor of two. We can do it all here integrated with, with the plotting commands. So that, that's, I would say, it's a huge advantage as compared to if you have, um, let's say, um, if you combine an, an old older variant perhaps of, of plotting um, in, in scripting would be that you would combine bash scripts, orc, and perhaps a GNU plot. And that, that, that's perfectly fine, but then you would need perhaps to do the, the arithmetics, multiplying with two, uh, separate in a separate script, and then you have the plotting script. Yeah. Uh, here you have the full arithmetics, uh, and you can integrate it with Pandora or whatever, so you can do it all in one. Okay, so here is, you can see here in the panel, what you're aiming for. So if you compare here to above, you see it's slightly different because it's more data and you have latins. So now time is 10 to the full hour. And we will have the exercise and we should also leave time for a yeah. break. Should we say, well, how long should the exercise have? I think 15 minutes. Okay. And then 10 minutes break. Should so perhaps to qu qu quarter past the full hour. I'm writing down break first so it fits in the hour time and then exercise, but people can do whatever they want. Oh. So, yeah, so we come back at 16 past the hour, and you should have at least a 10 minute break there and 15 minutes to work on the exercise. Um, yes, so I'm switching to HackMD here with the break notification and yeah 
Okay, so see you in 25 minutes. Bye. Hello, we are back. So, let's see, I guess. So, there weren't too many questions, and some of them we will talk about right now. Um, yeah, let's actually get right to it. So, I'm coming to my screen. So, here's the exercise we just did. And now we're getting to the matplotlib has two interfaces part of things. So, yeah. So what's the point here? Um, as many people have noticed based on the chat, these two interfaces can be a bit confusing. So the traditional interface, the pyplot interface, is sort of what was designed to look like MATLAB and has global state. So basically, you only call some functions and in the background somewhere, it's remembering what you've done and makes the plots. So this is simple, at least, because there's just one sort of, like, you don't have to worry what's the plot, what's the plot objects, things like that. You sort of run from top to bottom. And it works well in scripts and things like that. So for example, if you, oh, let's see, what's an example? Yeah, like in a Jupyter notebook, if you are if you made it so it's designed to run from top to bottom, then it works. Or you have a single separate Python file and you run that and it makes a few plots. This can work okay. But what happens if you're doing something really complex and you have, for example, um, you're reading in a bunch of data and you're generating two plots at the same time and incrementally adding data. Or you want to start making a plot and call another function that will do some standard setup or something. So this pyplot interface can start becoming a bit of a bottleneck. So let's look in particular what the difference is here. So it looks the same until here. And here we see we call the subplots function, which gives us a figure object and an axis object. And the figure contains all the information about the figure and the axis contains all the information about the axis. And then when we run the scatter plot, it's a method of the axis object. So we're telling run the scatter plot on this axis object directly. When we're setting these labels, we set it on this particular axis that was made here. We could have another axis going around and it's still clear. While the traditional interface, here we call plot.scatter. And then plot that x label, plot that y, plot that title. So since plot is the module, there's only one pyplot module. And thus you can only be working on one plot at a time. So yeah, and this has been confusing to many people over the years. So when I was using matplotlib a lot, I would try to use this object-oriented interface, which took a little bit more time to sort of get used to and learn how it works. But I mean, in the end, I was basically copying and pasting things anyway. Uh, yeah. So when you're finding stuff online, finding examples, you might see something that's written in one of these, but you need to translate it to the other one in your code and vice versa. Um, so this lesson recommends to try to use the object oriented face. And personally, that's what I would try to do also. Um, but they both work.
yeah. Let's see, any HackMD questions on the topic? Mm. Yeah. Is that enough? Did I convince you, Johan? Do you have an idea of yes, which I, is which? I, I, I think so. Okay. I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So, so we could move on to the yeah. topic of styling and customization of yeah. plots. Should I go to your screen? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yes, please. Okay. There you go. So, how to style plots? Mm. Yes. So, yeah, no, um... so we already mentioned this that there are benefits with not um, customizing and styling your plots uh, manually but it's better to do it as an integrated part when plotting the data in the first place and uh, there's a quasi unlimited uh, opportunities for how you can style the data and something which can be very useful is that you can have variants of your graphs that are for different purposes. So let's say you have a data set with, uh, you need to, three figures for it. Then perhaps these three figures uh, are to go into a manuscript. And then you make them with uh, a certain uh, font size and, and a certain uh, thickness and, and color scheme for the for the markers and the lines so that it looks good when you put it into a document which is probably in the end uh, shared as a pdf file and perhaps goes into, into printing into a paper copy then you then probably also have that you would like to use uh, the same figures the same contents in uh, in slides when giving a talk or it could be that you would like to web post it on a website. And for both these two other channels, having the slide presentation material and having the web hosted material, you might then need to use a slightly different um, set of font sizes and and, uh, and, 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 and and tweak them a little bit to, to get good uh, ratios between can also be between, let's say, the X and Y axis uh, to be presented on, on, on a screen of projector of different sizes. And with, with the Matplotlib, you can then do it so that you, within the same script, essentially generate all of, all of the needed um, versions of, of the figures in an efficient manner. So, uh, we will, you, you will find here, uh, these are not here in, right here in the lesson, but, but you will find them lower down. Um, namely, yeah, the, the, we actually have links here at the, the exercise customization three. We have links to gallery. So perhaps Richard, you could, you could paste that into to HackMD. Yeah, okay. I will. And I move in here to the screen. So um, we do have then these other libraries, Seaborn, Altair, Plotly, and so forth. Now, holding on to Matplotlib, I'll go here to the um, examples gallery. And here we find nice um, examples of different kind of plots with both the output and with the code needed to render these so um, you can start with something simple a uh, color bar mm -hmm. so here we have a traditional color bar with uh, broad uh, bars uh, in distinct colors uh, okay apple and cherry here are very similar in color actually <laughs> Uh, and as you can see here, the lines of number lines of code here are rather few, which is not surprising because it's a simple graphical object. So 
So another kind of bar plot would be oh I lost them. Uh, horizontal bar chart. The stack bars. Oh. This is somewhat longer code. And um, we have had election in a few countries um, on the international level here fully. We had them in the US midterm elections. Uh, a bit earlier in the autumn, we had the national elections in Sweden. And um, this is, let's say, you have. <laughs> one red block and, and one green block and, and some um, other independent parties. Then to visualize um, how to reach a majority in the House or in the Senate, this would be, I mean, you probably have all seen this kind of, of bar plots mm -hmm. in, in, in the, the news media. Uh, and what one can emphasize here, yeah, for instance, here, uh, within the bars here, you do find the actual numbers here, yeah. 29 and 10 and so forth. So if, if, if this is something discrete, for instance, uh, the actual, because after all, the number of seats in, in a parliament is a discrete number, it's not a floating point number. Yeah, there's actually quite a lot here, like the legend, the colors, the numbers inside the bars. Figuring this out yourself would take a long time, but copying and that, pasting. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's a good point indeed. Like, so, so, so instead of, of trying to uh, go through the full API of Matplotlib and, and to hierarchically search for what are the precise commands to use, you could then look you, you can start off looking at the examples and 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 then do effectively copy paste and and, and modifying isn't that a great lesson now so matplotlib is too complex no one figures it out you look at the gallery and copy but i think really that's what the moral is here yeah in in, in this case i mean I, I would be rather skeptical to copy paste um, uh, style of, of, of programming in general, but, but for this purpose here, uh, I, I do think it's adequate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and finally, we could, uh, what can be shown? Yeah. A traditional two dimensional plot here. And uh, what we have here that you, you can have very wide range of different markers. You can have here we have six panels and um, it's very ma many tools have uh, subplot commands so it's easy to get the panels up but it can also be uh, a real mess if you just push the button yeah. so to find a good trade-off here being for, for the size of the panels and uh, also then for the size of the fonts and, and the markers is very important. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you, you probably have often noticed that that this kind of, in a way, rather big font sizes are actually what goes into print in, in PDF versions of, of figures. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, uh, that was a third example. So I think we go back here now to the, to the lesson. And we will now come to an exercise, styling and customization. Uh, we do have here as many as three exercises. Uh, exercises one and two are on how to tweak the look of, of plots. And example three is a bit different because then it's about how to modify the input data. So we will, in a minute, we will let you work on that. And then Richard, how is the plan then? When we reconvene, then we will have a walkthrough of another example. Yeah, I guess we can do one of the examples when we're back and we stop the lesson at zero, zero of the hour. Yeah. Yes, yes. So I think we could 
probably take uh, yeah 19 minutes uh, uh, up until 50 for the exercises. Yeah. Okay. So as I said there are three of them and choose to work with one of them or work with two if you have time. Yeah. Whatever. Whatever you're interested in. Okay. So we will see you in uh 20 minutes yes bye bye hello we're back there's some good questions here in hackmd you might see but we're going to johan's screen now yes so um we will here make a little bit of an example exploration of another library, namely the Simon library. So first we can see what is the, the, the graphical field of this library. So if we follow this link here, we'll find here a large number of really appealing figures which have been created with, with this uh, library. And one of them which catches my attention here is this here, and this is called the uh, violin plot. And uh, with a bit of imagination, yeah, this looks like a violin. There is a code snippet for it, which we have here. Yeah, okay. Um, and what have that produced? It, it has produced uh, these blob, these elongated blobs here that are visualizing some data and yeah for the time being here uh, we, we are just looking on on the on so to say the, the aesthetic and and the graphical properties of things here so we are ignorant about what this data is uh, if you look here in the code you can see that this is actually random numbers mm -hmm. yeah um so I move back now to my Jupyter notebook and uh, what we're going to do here is that we will play around with this code snippet. So I'll paste all of this to notebook. And uh, yeah, before executing it, uh, we can just highlight here that we needed to import NumPy and then this Seaborn library. And, and Richard, how is it? Uh, we, we don't import matplotlib here. So right. it's mat yeah. That's probably not needed. I guess Seaborn would import it as the back end without us needing to know anything about it. Yes. So. Yeah, set theme doesn't have any arguments in here. Um, here we are creating the data set. Yeah, so we... well, somehow it's a bunch of random stuff. Yeah, in this. I yeah. guess we don't need five, to worry too much. Well, yeah. And yeah, we, we should then put into this D variable and uh, we We'll throw it with the violin plot command by executing this statement. Um, yeah, as first we see here, written to standard out in, in the Jupyter notebook, we, we see here the contents of the, the array. And as you can see, it's a lengthy array. Just scroll past it. And we here then get this nice set of blobs and there are here as many as eight of them. Uh, what we would like to do here is to, um, we, we would like to concentrate on how do you produce one of these objects. So we then play around a little bit and we try with a much simpler D, okay. namely in form of just this simple array. Yeah. Which is defined here inlined in, in the code snippet. So I'll copy that code 
paste it into the Jupyter Notebook and execute. What do we get here? Okay, we get we get two of these yeah. plots. Looks good. So, do we add in some other data then? Um... No, I think at this point uh, this I think we, can, we, 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 we yeah we, we can leave it. Yeah, so we can we can do whatever we needed to. Yeah. So, so what should we switch to HackMD and look for interesting questions to answer, or is it, what? Well, let's wrap up here. Yeah, that, that's a good idea. We, we could just um, yeah, that's a very a brief yeah. mentioning here. I just scroll back up here. I mean, yeah. to, just to highlight that it's under the heading here, exercise customization three. Here is where you find all of these links to the other libraries. So we had here now Seaborn, mm -hmm. then you have these other uh, libraries. And uh, yeah, so Richard, um, do you want to take the screen for the HackMD? Sure. Um, yeah, so what was the overall summary here? We started with this idea, all the plot generation should be automatic. And hopefully we've shown you that that's actually pretty reasonable to do. So it can take time to figure out all the customizations you need. And maybe sometimes you need to tell your supervisor, okay, that's hard. Can we find a more practical way to do it? But if you can do it this way, then you've made a very good investment in your future. And for the most part, when everyone uses Netplotlib, it's finding the examples and updating. So with that being said, uh, let's see. There's some errors here which can be debugged in HackMD, hard to say anything now. Is it possible to update the XY labels after they've been created? So yes, if you look into all the methods on the axes objects, like there's ways to get those labels and change their sizes. But also in practice, you might have say one function that produces the data, and then it's handed off to another function that makes the plots. And it might be easier to remake the whole plot rather than try to update only little bits of the plots. So it's sort of, well, um, yeah. Let's see. Here's an interesting uh, suggestion here in the HackMD that one can convert matplotlib um, code to ticks plots for latech mm. using the tool ticks plotlib. Okay. Um, and then that can so, be inserted directly into LaTeX or something like that. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know about that. Ticks is kind session session program, I think. Yeah. Um, so one remark about this with reproducibility. So sharing of Matplotlib scripts, um, or I mean with colleagues and collaborators uh, is relatively straightforward as it is, um, I mean, widely available free source code. Yeah. Um, that we, we, it works on, on most operating systems because um, we, we, we had, um, well, somewhat anecdotal, but, but I, it happened for me many times that I've had Mat MATLAB scripts, which are doing the job really, really well. It's just that uh, if the person that you're working with, if they do not have the license for MATLAB, then it might be different, mm. uh, difficult for them to, to run it. Yeah. So we are at the full hour, so we should perhaps uh, yeah. 
wrap it up, to conclude for Mapplelib, and uh, let's see what do we have after the break, Richard. Then we have after the break is data visualization. So maybe let's go straight there, and we can keep answering questions on the notes. Okay. So see you in ten minutes. Bye. Bye.